Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Was reading a book. <laughs> Getting ready for tomorrow. Well, thank you and welcome to the 18th National Book Festival. Founded by First Lady Laura Bush almost 20 years ago, and it has become a Washington-based tradition. When the greatest writers and illustrators come to our national and our nation's capital to celebrate books, reading, and the essential part it plays in our lives. I know everyone in this room is a book lover, so you know how a single book can inspire, teach, and dream, and make us dream. At the Library of Congress, we are here to inspire artists, writers, and history makers through our collections. The library has recently been working with the renowned design firm Pentagram on a new look, one that reflects the institution's move towards the future. Our goal is to make the library more accessible to the American public coast to coast. We think it's a bold new look that showcases the library's collection, resources, and services for Congress and for you. And you're supposed to see it. <laughs> I'm John Meacham. My name is Bill Gates. My name is Andre Asiman. My name is Becky Albertalli. My name is Tracy K. Smith. My name is Brandon Beck. My name is Yasmin Rosli. Hello, I'm Tony Bennett. I love books. I love libraries. The Library of Congress is a library for me. I'm Carla Hayden, the Librarian of Congress. The Library of Congress is a library for you. What will you do? Start exploring at loc.gov. And tonight, we would not be here without the library's chief benefactor and supporter, the United States Congress. I want to thank all of the members of Congress and their staff for making the library the world's largest and greatest repository of knowledge and creativity. The National Book Festival is made possible only, and I, this is underlined, you should see it, only <laughs> through the generos generosity of its donors. And our most generous supporter of the festival is the co-chairman, Mr. David M. Rubenstein. He is truly the embodiment of patriotic philanthropy. His generosity can be seen and felt all over this town, at the Kennedy Center, the National Archives, the Smithsonian, and of course, in his funding of the restoration of the Washington Monument following the 2011 earthquake. His giving to the library extends beyond the National Book Festival. He also supports the literacy awards and the many programs and exhibits of the library. So, Mr. Rubenstein, David, on behalf of the nation, thank you. In 
In addition to Mr. Rubenstein, I'd also like to thank other sponsors who make the book festival a free event, and think about that, a free event for everyone to enjoy. Our charter sponsors, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, IMLS, the Washington Post, and Wells Fargo. Patrons, the James Madison Council, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, and of course, all of our many friends and media partners. You make this, we think, the best free event in Washington. I also want to acknowledge the more than 1,000 volunteers who come to the Rust through the Junior League of Washington and the general public. And of course, the hardworking staff of the library, especially Jared McNeil, our signature programs director, the proud father of twins, uh, two or three days ago. Uh, Marie Arana, our festival literary director and the library's development office. The beautiful National Book Festival poster this year was created by Gabby D'Alessandro, and I think it does a beautiful job of conveying how we explore and travel through books. Gabby is here. Will you take, stand up and take a bow? It really is a beautiful, beautiful representation of what books can do. We also have some young writers here tonight who are an inspiration to young people everywhere, the National Student Poets. These students, <laughs> these students from five areas across the country are really emblematic of the spirit of the National Book Festival. Will you please stand up so we can acknowledge your work? For 18 years, the library has been fortunate to host America's greatest fiction writers at this festival, from John Gresham and Toni Morrison and Philip Roth to Louise Erdrich. And some have gone on to be awarded our highest honor in that category, the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction. The recipient of the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction this year is Ms. Annie Prue. She has given us monumental sagas and keen-eyed, skillfully wrought stories. Her novel, The Shipping News, won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. She was the first woman to win the Penn Faulkner Award for postcards, and her story, Brokeback Mountain, was adopted into an Academy Award-winning film. Her latest novel is Bark Scans, and we will be presenting the award to Ms. Prue tomorrow at 10 a.m. on the fiction stage where Marie Arana will interview her, but you will hear from her tonight. So please congratulate the 2018 Library of Congress Prize winner for American Fiction, Ms. Annie Prue. Ms. Prue, stand up. <laughs> now, for the next day, we will celebrate books but our underlying love of reading is also coupled with providing an opportunity for people to learn how to read. There are far too many of people throughout the world who cannot read or do so at a low level, so low that they are functionally illiterate. And that's where Mr. Rubenstein comes in again. He is not only the primary sponsor of the National Book Festival, but he is the creator and the sole sponsor of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards. He doesn't just give the funding, he also personally promotes the importance of literacy and reading with unstinting passion. So please join me in watching this brief video about the Literacy Awards. People who can read, and do, are healthier, happier, and live longer than people who can't. 
they are more likely to get preventative health care and less likely to go to an emergency room. Women and girls who are educated have fewer children, and those they do have are twice as likely to survive. But illiteracy is widespread. Worldwide, 750 million adults, most of them women, cannot read or write a simple sentence. Launched with the creative vision and generosity of David M. Rubenstein, the Library of Congress Literacy Awards recognize and promote the achievements of organizations whose innovative, research-based practices are improving literacy worldwide. A committee of literacy experts evaluated nominations and presented their findings to the Librarian of Congress who selected winners in three categories. The $50,000 International Prize recognizes significant and measurable contributions to increasing literacy levels by an organization based outside the United States. The $50,000 American Prize recognizes significant and measurable contributions to increasing literacy levels on a national level. The $150,000 David M. Rubenstein Prize recognizes a domestic or international organization that has demonstrated exceptional and sustained depth in its commitment to the advancement of literacy. Please join Librarian of Congress Carla Hayden and Literacy Awards founder David M. Rubenstein in recognizing the achievements and innovations of the three organizations selected as winners of the 2018 Library of Congress Literacy Awards. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David M. Rubenstein, co-chairman of the National Book Festival and the originator and sponsor of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Carla, thank you for your very kind words, and I want to thank the Library of Congress staff for organizing liter literacy awards and for the people who've served on the committee. Um, uh, they've done all the hard work. Uh, and I want to assure you, I do have more than one tie and one suit. Um, I noticed it's the same one. Um, I have a few ties and a couple suits. Um, they look different, but anyway. How many people here have read the newspaper today or online, something relating to the newspaper? Any people? Okay. How many people here read a magazine the last week? Anybody? How many people read a, one book in the last year? How, all right. <laughs> How many people read 10 books in the last year? 20 books? 30 books? 40? Be honest. How many people read 50 books? Okay. So the truth is, uh, imagine your life if you hadn't been able to read any of those books and what your life would be like, how much less rich it would be. In my own case, um, I came from a family that uh, was not college or high school educated. And the great pleasure of my life was learning how to read and learning the world that was outside the world that I grew up in. And I grew up in Baltimore, and the head of the Enoch Pratt Library is now, which is the library in Baltimore, is now our Librarian of Congress. Um, the uh, first woman and the first uh, African American uh, to be Librarian of Congress. And, um, also, I think the first librarian to be Librarian of Congress in almost a century, so congratulations. <laughs> Sadly, and it's hard to believe, it is very hard to believe, but 45 million Americans, about 14% of our population, are functionally illiterate, which means they can't read past the fourth grade level. 30 Three million Americans cannot read at all. I mean, stop sign, nothing. They can't read at all. So this is a sad situation in a country that purports to be the wealthiest country in the world. And in many ways, when we complain about and we think about the terrible problem we have with income inequality and social mobility, it really goes back to, in my view, one of the major causes is lit literacy, the people's inability to read. Because if you cannot read, you have a very limited chance of getting a very good job. Those people who cannot read, functionally read, or read at all, have, are going to make less than uh, two-thirds of what 
or a third of what somebody who can read will make during the course of their lifetime. And that's going to be a sad. Not only will they not, not get the pleasure of reading and the joy of life that all of you have from reading, but they're going to earn a lot less. In addition, you should recognize that people who cannot read have a much greater chance of being in our federal criminal system. In fact, roughly 65% of the people in our federal prisons are functionally illiterate. And roughly 80% of the people who are in our juvenile delinquency system are functionally illiterate. And so if you cannot read, you're not likely to make a very good living. You're not, you may well be in, in need of public assistance. And in fact, 80% of the people who are in public assistance are functionally illiterate. So this problem is not just for the generation of adults that I'm talking about, but it's also for children. Because as we all know, the best way to teach a child to read is by parental reading to them. But if you can't read as a parent, how can you read to your children? And so what happens is very often is that children who have, are the children of parents who cannot read, they don't learn how to read. And therefore, when the time comes to measure them in third or fourth grade, they fall way behind. The children who are parents who cannot read have about a 20% chance of being um, able to get through the fourth grade proficiency levels. And if you can't read at the fourth grade level, by the time you're in the fourth grade, you, in other words, you're not really uh, reading proficient, you have a much greater chance of being a high school dropout. In fact, 75% of the people who drop out of high school are functionally illiterate. And by the time they were in the fourth grade, they were really already behind. So there's no one thing that we can do that's gonna solve this problem. The literacy awards are designed to get some attention to it. As Doris Kearns Goodwin would say about somebody she wrote about, uh, the world will little note nor long remember what we uh, do here tonight. And the awards are relatively modest. It's my attempt to get some attention uh, for this. And the Library of Congress, obviously, by being involved and doing all the hard work, they make it much more important than it otherwise would be if I was just doing it myself. So I want to thank the Library of Congress for doing this. But everybody here that cares about literacy, it's been involved in literacy organizations, deserves uh, the credit for actually helping to solve this problem and deal with this problem. But this problem is much bigger than anybody in this room is going to be able to solve. We need much more federal resources. We need much more public attention. And we need to recognize that we're ever going to solve the income inequality problem and the social mobility problem in this country, we have to begin with teaching young children how to read and have to enjoy reading. And all of you would probably say that if you didn't know how to read, your life would be less fulfilling. That's for sure. You might have less money, but you're more fulfilling, less fulfilling a life. So I just want you to think tonight uh, as you go to the National Book Festival tomorrow and you enjoy, enjoy hearing and reading the authors, and, and seeing the people and the young children particularly who are going there to learn, who are reading and getting their books autographed, how sad it is that so many people are shut out from this because they don't know how to read, they don't know the pleasure of reading, they don't know the pleasure of reading books, and they have very little chance of leading the kind of life that all of us would like our children to lead and that all of us pretty much lead ourselves. So thank you to the Library of Congress for doing this, and I'd like to ask Carla if she'd come up and we can uh, hand out the awards. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the 2018 International Prize of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards is the Instituto Pedagogico para Problemas del Lenguaje of Mexico City. The Instituto is a nonprofit organization founded 50 years ago that is dedicated to supporting deaf children and children with language and learning disabilities, primarily from impoverished families through educational programs and after-school support. Accepting the award is Executive Director Mercedes Obregon. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the 2018 American Prize of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards is the East Side Community School of New York City. The school is a 6th through 12th grade Title I public school that has developed a vibrant, long-running reading program. Accepting the award is Principal Mark Fetterman.
Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the 2018 David M. Rubenstein Prize of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards is Reading is Fundamental of Washington, D.C. <laughs> Founded in 1966, Reading is Fundamental works to create a literate America by inspiring a passion for reading among all children by providing quality content and engaging communities in the solution to give every child the fundamentals for success. Founded in 1966, the organization works to create a literate America by inspiring a passion for reading among all children. Accepting the award is Alicia Levy, President and CEO. Reading is fundamental is something you've all heard about, and uh, of course that was started by Margaret McNamara, Mrs. Uh, Robert McNamara, and her daughter is here, and I want to thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, and other daughter here, thank you. Can you stand up, Margie. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And you should know that there's a sign here that says, do not touch or move this microphone. And Mr. Rubenstein wanted to make sure that Ms. McNamara was okay. given her. Uh, because we want to give you a special gift. Okay. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> now, it was hard to think of something to surprise him, because you see, he's quite something. <laughs> and we hope this fills the bill. Please accept this original creation by Michael Carve. No. He is the creator of Comic Riffs, column at the Washington Post, and a great friend of the festival. And he has given this gift to the library to give to you. It is an interesting representation of you <laughs> in comic form. Michael, would you please join us? And it's Kavna. Michael Kavna. Kavna. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, Mr. Rubinson, I had only seen, I did Google images, and I had only seen one type of suit and one color tie. <laughs> I apologize. All were immaculate, but uh, when certain people talk about rigged Google algorithms, uh, we might want to look into that. But it was a pleasure, and what you know, we uh, I went to Gilbert Stewart because I went through Jefferson, and I felt like to to do you right, I needed to channel Gilbert Stewart, who had had a studio here in 1803, and Gilbert Stewart who died 190 years ago and his spirit, Gilbert Stewart's spirit lives on of his unfinished Washington portrait. I was given a tight deadline. This was almost an unfinished David Rubenstein portrait. <laughs> but it was an honor, sir. Uh, Gilbert Stewart did the first six presidents, and you are such a, a, an amazing, not only generous of spirit, but such a true book lover yourself. So thank you. Thank you All right, thank you. Okay. I think we got him. All right, thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is very hard to surprise him. And now, and thank you, Michael. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are proud to present our 2018 National Book Festival Authors Program. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Brian Selznick. I wrote down every single word I'm going to say. 
Dr. Hayden, special guests, fellow authors, illustrators, young poets, award winners, and book lovers, it's an honor to be speaking to you here tonight. And I want to say that on Halloween of last year, I got a call from Scholastic asking me to draw new covers to help celebrate the 20th anniversary of Harry Potter. 20 years. I found myself trying to remember what was going on in the world 20 years ago when the Harry Potter books were first published in America. Luckily, my husband, David Serlin, is a historian and has a better memory than I do. He reminded me that 20 years ago, we were living here in Washington, DC, about six blocks from where uh, we are right now, while he had a fellowship at the Smithsonian, and I worked on a book about Amelia Earhart and Eleanor Roosevelt's friendship. Movies like Armageddon, Saving Private Ryan, The Truman Show, and You've Got Mail dominated at the box office. Frank Sinatra died. Google became a company. Aretha Franklin stepped in at the last minute for Luciano Pavarotti at the 1998 Grammy Awards and sang Nessum Dorma, or None Shall Sleep, which now seems a little bit like a warning. <laughs> there was a president in the White House around whom there was much talk of impeachment, and a Republican senator from Arizona had just died. The best thing that can ever be said of anyone is that they served a cause greater than their self-interest. Those words were spoken by the late Senator John McCain at Barry Goldwater's funeral. And today, those very words are being spoken by so many others about Senator McCain as he lies in state across the street. Our lives and history itself often feel like an obstacle course we're navigating in the dark. We stumble from one unimaginable moment to the next, and it's only when we look back that we can see a path. Hindsight is what turns experience into stories. Sometimes the story feels like a circle, but that's what human beings do. We turn everything into stories, as if we had storytelling in our DNA. And sometimes a storyteller comes along who seems able to distill vast and important ideas into something that connects with their culture, and they offer back to civilization a reflection of ourselves, which speaks to our needs as individuals and as a society. That's what I think J.K. Rowling did with the Harry Potter books. I was a relative newcomer to the books when Scholastic called me last Halloween. I had only read them for the first time two years earlier in 2015. If you haven't read them, they're very good, by the way. <laughs> Even though I hadn't actually read them myself, I always loved the phenomenon of them. As a former independent bookseller, and very proud of that fact, I loved walking by bookstores at midnight and seeing the vast lines of families in costume and hearing a kind of excitement for books and stories that perhaps hadn't been experienced by the culture as a whole since 19th century crowds gathered at the docks in New York Harbor waiting for copies of the last installment of Charles Dickens's The Old Curiosity Shop to find out whether or not Little Nell had lived or died. And I'm not gonna spoil it for you here. <laughs> so, at last, three years ago, I decided to jump in and read the Harry Potter series myself. I was overwhelmed and immediately became a huge fan. Wizards, magic, dragons, giants, elves, orphans, evil, hypocrisy, bravery, friendship, tragedy, betrayal, hope, and love. Somehow Rowling had taken all these elements and made something new. She put all of us at the center of the most extraordinary narrative about someone whose life affects and is affected by earth-shaking events. She forced us to ask big questions. What do we do when everything around us seems hopeless? When the people we most trust die? And when the institutions we most love begin to crumble around us? In many ways, these books remind us that in the darkest of times, it's books themselves we can turn to for help. They remind us that we need heroes and that we can be heroes. And maybe unconsciously, we are aware that like books, our own lives unfold in chapters from our infancy, through our childhood, and into our adulthood and old age. Different chapters, perhaps, but all the same story. I think that's why when I was asked to draw new covers for the books, I knew right away I wanted to do one long epic drawing that would span all seven covers when lined up, a visual narrative that would try to parallel what Rowling does in the stories. 
I wanted the covers to focus on the relationships between the characters, the queer idea of family, non-biologically related people who you find yourself related to through shared interests, ideas, love, and dreams. The families that Harry Potter himself creates are particularly complex and beautiful. I wanted to draw these relationships, these families, in my covers. Most of all, I wanted the main theme of my covers to be the battle between good and evil, since that was the element of the books I found most intriguing and the one I believe is currently most important and relevant. The books terrify us with the prospect that Voldemort, the embodiment of evil, could win the battle. And if he does win, what then? We get glimpses of what happens when evil gains power in the books. One of the most terrifying villains in the story for me is Dolores Umbridge, who dresses in bright pink and collects porcelain cats, but who uses bureaucracy to terrify and torture those who are weak or powerless. It's a brilliant examination of hypocrisy when people in power say they are helping, but do so while hurting others. Dolores illuminates a corrupted soul and shows why we must fight against anyone like her. Up against all this evil are Harry and his friends. They suffer, they lose people they love, they make mistakes. They are young and they fight heroically and they suffer greatly. But by the last book, they are undaunted and they are together. Theirs is a story worth sharing. Those of us gathered here tonight and those of us coming this weekend for the National Book Festival understand that empathy, love, and understanding can be gained through books as well as through the act of reading. And children's books are where a lifelong love of reading and empathy for others begins. I think that the Harry Potter books were, in their way, quite prescient. 20 years later, Rowling's vision of children saving us, children stepping up and pointing the way to the future, is echoed in the actions of young people today, many of whom are taking to the streets, protesting injustice, speaking out, confronting evil. These young people were raised in the spirit of Harry Potter, whose frame of reference for most of their lives was leadership associated with decency and intelligence and empathy. They are fighting back and will continue to fight back. We must support them. J.K. Rowling knew it was the children who will help us win the battle. That's why I'm proud to be here today representing Harry Potter at the National Book Festival, where we are reminded that now, more than ever, what we need to celebrate and support are good stories, the endless power of books, and the vast bravery of children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Library of Congress's National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, Jacqueline Woodson. Thank you. Can I touch it to adjust it? Okay. Yes. I could have written a speech like Brian's. <laughs> if Aretha hadn't died. If her funeral hadn't lasted for eight hours and was televised. Um, but um, Brian, thank you. Thank you for your words and your work. And the first thing I want to say um, is give literacy all your money. Just all your money. It's, I have this poster in my office at home and it says, you have to give it away to keep it. And I think about that every day, the fact that what we put out into the world comes back to us. And the idea that as writers, um, we can't have readers if people can't read. 
And we have to support our readers in that way. I've been National Ambassador for Young People's Literature since January, and I've been going around the country talking about the importance of reading, how reading equals hope times change, that when we read, it changes us, um, it gives us hope. And for the writers in the room, you know, since 2016, it has been very hard to feel hopeful. And as a result, not only is it hard to feel hopeful, but it's hard to create art when you're not feeling hopeful. Um, and one of the ways I find hope is by talking to the young people and talking to the people who are engaging in the literature. And very often, traveling through the country, I come across lots of young people who can't engage in the literature to the extent that we like them to because of their inability to process it. Um, I want to give a huge shout out to um, the Instituta, to Reading is Fundamental, and to Eastside Community School for the work that you're doing to create young people who are reading. And Reading is Fundamental. I know everyone who's around my age remembers the commercial with the little boy, and Reading is Fundamental. And how even as young people, we didn't know what fundamental meant, but we knew <laughs> that it was something important and that one day we'd understand it, but in the meantime we had riff and it had something to do with books and it had something to do with a party that we were invited to. And speaking of parties that we we're invited to, I want to thank Dr. Carla Hayden for opening up the Library of Congress to all of us. I didn't even understand what this place was before you became a part of it and I saw that it was a place that I was welcome to be a part of and to be in and to explore. So getting back to the literacy thing, I'm going to tell a story about my kids. So don't groan, it's quick. Um, I have a 10-year-old son, Jackson Leroy, and I have a 16-year-old daughter. And um, when my son was four years old, we realized he needed glasses. And when he was about um, seven, we realized that he was reading differently from other people. And then we got him tested and we found out that he um, had a lot of reading differences and, um, and that he was having a lot of stress about how he, knowing he was reading different. And I know there are a lot of people in the room who've encountered the young people who's, who read differently. And um, about two months ago, we had our 16-year-old daughter tested. I, I should stop and tell you, uh, my partner is Juliette Whitoff. She's the most wonderful woman in the world. She's an amazing physician. She works at a place called Cal and Lord and does just world-changing work. Uh, and because we're two women, we can decide who gets to have what kid when. So. <laughs> I gave birth to my daughter Toshi, my partner gave birth to um, our son Jackson. We have these two amazing kids and um, we love them very much. And then when they get on our ner nerves, I get to go off as ambassador and she gets to go to the clinic. Um, but but um, I read differently as a young person. I, I knew that I would have been diagnosed as dyslexic in this day and age, but I grew up in a neighborhood where parents weren't spending lots of money to get psychosocials done to find out what was going on with their kids reading. Um, but we did that. We got our, both our kids tested and it turned out that both of them had um, reading differences and that there's a whole industry out there where you can pay lots of money to get your kids on par up to level. And there are a lot of people that don't have that money. Not only do they not have the money to find out what their young people are struggling with, but they don't have the money to then help them get through that struggle. And there's so many places where, so many schools where they don't have the tools to help the young people with those struggles. Um, and it's hard, and it's hard for me as a mom to figure out what the playing field is I'm choosing for my young people. And it's hard for me as ambassador to go around the country and see how many young people are struggling, either because they don't have access to books in their homes, because um, their parents haven't had the tools to learn to read so that they could then go and read to the young people, uh, or because they're undiagnosed in some way. And I think as writers, as readers, as people who have means, as people who have 
access, we can change the world, we can change this narrative, and we can end the school to prison pipeline that is coming out of what Mr. Rubenstein said about kids who don't, are, are weak readers becoming the people who are feeding the prison industrial complex. So um, I wanna thank the universe for giving me the gift to write. Um, I wanna thank the writers who came before me. I know we all have writers that came before us who taught us. For me, it was James Baldwin and Audre Lorde and so many more. Um, I wanna thank the Library of Congress for giving us the space to actually have these conversations about what it means to create readers and learners and thinkers. And I, I wanna thank you for really thinking about giving all the money <laughs> to, to, and you don't have to give all of it. You can give the royalties of, you know, a part of one book. You can give the royalties of all of one book. Um, you know, there, there are ways to do this. I, I was watching Aretha's funeral all day long, and I swear it was on all day long. And it was amazing. But I thought about tithing in the black church and in many churches you tithe, right? You give a percentage of your income towards some kind of greater good. And this is the greater good we need to put our finances into right now. This is going to change the world. This is gonna level the playing field. Um, if we're not thinking about doing it for the young people, uh, for the adults, let's do it for the young people. So that's all I got to say, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Meacham. Okay, Ambassador Woodson had a medal. <laughs> Brian writes better than Rowling. Um, <laughs> thanks y'all for coming. Uh, this may be the most significant gathering of talent and skill and literary ability in one room since Doris Kearns Goodwin dined alone. Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, I love the National Book Festival because of its humbling function for me. 10 years ago, I was here, and I was on my way to give my talk at that point about Andrew Jackson, and a woman ran up to me, which doesn't happen enough, <laughs> or ever because if they would, they'd have to get out of their medical device if they wanted to see me, but anyway. Um, and she said, oh my God, it's you. And I said, well, yes, you know. Ex existentially speaking, that's hard to argue with. And she said, I just admire your work so much. Your books have meant so much to me and my family. Will, will you wait right here, and uh, I'm gonna get your new book and have you sign it? And I said, yes, ma'am. And I was standing there thinking, this is the way the world is supposed to be. Women are supposed to admire you. They're supposed to ask you to sign their books. This was perfect. She brought back John Grisham's latest novel. <laughs> so it gets worse. At that point, I was writing a biography of George Herbert Walker Bush. And I, that was a Saturday. And I went up to Kenny Bunkport the next day. And I was at lunch with the Bushes. And I told the story, expecting some kind of motherly reassurance from Mrs. Bush. She looked across the table and said, well, how do you think poor John Grisham would feel? You know, you know he's a very handsome man. <laughs> so, and you put me after these two, so I'm never coming back. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Uh, no, I'm uh, delighted to be here, honored to be here. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a story, but it's why I write about what I write, and it has to do with both the past and the future for me. And I think that ultimately that's the significance of history, is it is our past, but I firmly believe, as much as I believe anything, that it is absolutely essential to shaping the present and the future. I grew up on Missionary Ridge, a Civil War battlefield in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was the place where Braxton Bragg lost to uh, General Grant. It's how Sherman got to Georgia, so my friends in Atlanta never came to visit. I'll wait, it's kind of funny. Um, you get farther north here, you have to let, let that simmer a bit. Um, 
I grew up 600 yards from Bragg's headquarters. It's where the line was broken. It's where Arthur MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur's father, won the Medal of Honor at the age of 17. Two miles down the road the other way was Chief John Ross's house, the head of the Cherokee Nation, the Cherokee tribe which did more than any other to meet the demands of a white majoritarian uh, authority and yet still found itself fundamentally betrayed by that country. There, for me, I could find Manet balls still in the yard where I grew up. History was a tactile thing, and it was also incredibly complex because there were two living monuments to two of the great original sins of American life, African-American slavery and Native American removal. And yet, the house in which I grew up, the house that was between those two places, was my grandfather's house. He was born in 1913. On June 22nd, 1941, as a practicing lawyer, he decided to join the United States Navy because Hitler had just invaded the Soviet Union. My grandfather believed that at that point, war was inevitable, global war, and he wanted to be first in line. And spent four years in the Pacific, I'm one of those people who would not be here if Harry Truman had not made the decision he made in late July and August of 1945, because my grandfather was set to be part of the invasion of the home islands with an unimaginable casualty figures. Again, complexity, the general and the universal, but with a discernible personal impact. I believe that I was drawn to history and to biography because I grew up not in a land of where there were absolute moral certitudes of black and white and good and evil, but a kind of ambiguity. And I was taught because of the heroism of that man whose house sat between these two emblems of our falling short, that the important thing was to stay in the fight because the United States, had it not been founded, had we not come through the cataclysm of the war, had we not continued the, the journey and the search, not for a perfect union, but for a more perfect one, we would never have been able to project the force across the seas to defeat tyranny at mid-century in, the, United, in, in the, the Second World War. And so between these two sins stood a man I revered, who was not perfect, but who did the right thing and put his life on the line for others. In that moral universe, in the, in the contradictory nature of that, I began to see that the human story was in fact the most representative one, the most enduring one. And I think we learn most from the past, not when we look down on it condescendingly or up at it adoringly, but when we look at it in the eye, take it for what it was, and realize that the damn miracle of the United States is that we've gotten this much right. We live in a fallen, sinful world. The founders understood it. The Constitution is one of the most, most Calvinistic documents you can imagine. It assumes that we're driven by appetite and ambition. It assumes that we're mostly going to do the wrong thing. And they were right. But what did it give us? It gave us the means by which to seek our better angels. And I don't know about you all, but in the course of a given day, if I get things right 51% of the time, that's a hell of a good day. And I think that's true in the lives of nations as well. I've written about uh, very complicated men and women, mostly men, I've written about them because, not because they were perfect, but because they were so imperfect and yet at critical moments rose to the occasion and pushed us forward, pushed us toward that more perfect union. I've written about Thomas Jefferson, a slave owner who nevertheless wrote the most important sentence ever written in the English language, as our friend David likes to say, that all men are created equal. I get nervous when I hear David say that about the most important sentence written in the English language because the phrase reminds me of the story about the Texas school board candidate 
who was running and was against Spanish being taught and went on the stump and said, if English was good enough for our Lord Jesus Christ, it's good enough for Texas. Um, yeah. As a Tennessean, we have to remind Texans that we would still be part of, they would still be part of Spain if it weren't for us. I made that joke once to Governor George W. Bush, and he said, <laughs> that's funny, asshole. Um, the miracle of the country is that despite our flaws, we stay in the fight, we get things right. A final story about the, another man I wrote about, written about Andrew Jackson, who saved the Union in 1832, Franklin Roosevelt, who saved democracy, saved capitalism, and yet signed Executive Order 9066, interning the Amer Japanese Americans. Written about George Herbert Walker Bush, who's gotten a lot wrong in his life, an imperfect man, but he did leave us with a more perfect union. And I'll leave you with this. About a year ago, the incumbent president, Voldemort, <laughs> was on his way to Nashville, where I live, to uh, give a, lay a wreath at the tomb of Andrew Jackson. I live in Nashville. And he was coming down, and I thought, well, I should do something. And so I wrote an open letter to the president that said, if you're going to embrace Andrew Jackson, don't just embrace the crazy parts, right? And there are plenty of crazy parts to, to embrace with Jackson. He once said that his only two regrets in public life were that he had not shot Henry Clay and hung John C. Calhoun, his own vice president. <laughs> we now know that no one felt that way about their running mate until John McCain. <laughs> um, but... Senator McCain liked that joke, actually, I can report. <laughs> I cleared it with him some years ago. Um, but I said, if you're going to deal, if you're going to embrace Jackson, he was, for all his faults, someone who believed in the American Union. He was devoted to the constitutional experiment, as flawed as it was. He kept us together through crisis. He was a great negotiator. He understood his weaknesses. He knew how to use them. And so I wrote this as an open letter. It ran in the local newspaper. It was on the front page of the paper. It's the only thing that greeted the president when he came to, to Nashville. It had no effect whatever. But the next day, true story, I was on my way into lunch, and my phone rang, and it was my most recent subject. It was George H.W. Bush. And he was in the hospital a lot that winter, and so his staff was giving him things to read, and he had read this. So he said, you know, get Meacham on the phone. Um, the key to doing George H.W. Bush's voice, by the way, is as Dana Carvey once said, Mr. Rogers trying to be John Wayne. <laughs> um, said, how you doing? I said, I'm fine, Mr. President. How are you? I said, I'm fine. He said, I read your letter to Jackson. I thought, ooh, the old boy's losing it, right? I mean, he thinks I'm writing letters to dead people. Um, so I said, well, Mr. President, thank you. You, you know, actually, it was a letter to, to Trump, not, not Jackson. He said, yeah, but Jackson will pay more attention. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Amy Tan. I've been sitting here thinking what excuse I could come up with to say, um, you know, why I'm not prepared. Uh, I had deadlines. I had three hours of sleep. I was in an airplane before I said to myself, I really do have to think about the fact that I'm going to be talking in front of any crew. Um, <laughs> I want to tell you a story about reading, and that is my debt of gratitude to the libraries. From the time I was a young child, I was from a immigrant, a frugal immigrant family, in fact, an illegal immigrant family. And we didn't have a lot of money for books. We didn't have books in the house. And so by the time I was six years old, I would walk to the library by myself and carry as many books as I could home to read. Now, I didn't learn how to read before that, because the powers that be in the 1950s 
uh, deemed it irresponsible of parents to teach their children how to read because they would probably do it by really dumb methods. And their children would end up with learning problems the rest of their lives, probably be chronic bedwetters and you know criminals and all kinds of things. So parents just didn't do that, hence no books in our house. I, Remember, though, in the first grade, there was a woman who confirmed this, that you shouldn't teach your children to read early on. She came and she pulled me out of the classroom and she gave me a test. And later on, she had, did an interview with my parents. I remember seeing her, this young woman, sitting in the living room. And at the end of this, my parents called me in and they told me the good news. They said that the woman had done this test and she told them that I had what it would take to be a doctor. This is like heroin to a Chinese parent. <laughs> you know, so not only was I going to be a concert pianist, that it was already in the works, I was going to be a doctor. They told me also my English skills were not that great, so, but you know, doctors and pianists, they really did not need to have that, so it wasn't a problem. The woman came twice a year, gave me these tests, and the test became longer and longer. I could never finish. I thought I was becoming dumber and dumber. Maybe she was wrong about the first test. I wasn't smart enough to be a doctor, but I had to keep up the pretense. My self-esteem was based on those tests. I felt I was not adequate to the task of fulfilling my immigrant parents' dreams. And I had a secret dream myself, and that was to become an artist. I loved to draw. But that dream kind of went north when my teacher, my art teacher, when I was 16, wrote in my report card that I had no imagination, which was necessary to a deeper level of creativity. <laughs> OK, so out the window goes there. Uh, that, at the, about the same time, I got my SAT scores, and I scored in the 400s in English not really encouraging for somebody who might want to make their living out of the artful arrangement of words. Around that time, my father and my brother died of brain tumors. Fortunately, I became a very rebellious girl. So a year into being a pre-med major, I quit, and I became an English major, much to the horror of my mother. But I love to read. I finished that major in about three years, and I became a linguistics major and got a graduate degree in that because I loved words. I loved the feel, the texture, the, all the different ways you could interpret words. I eventually became a writer, a business writer. I wrote things like direct mail, the things you get in the mail that says, you know, act now and you get 20% off. <laughs> I was very good at that. I wrote business articles, telecommunications. I hated it. And it wasn't until I was 33 years old, 33 years ago, that I started writing fiction. Now, well, fast forward. A few years ago, I was writing on my, trying to write, uh, finish my latest book, which people call a memoir. It's really my, my imaginings about why I became a writer. And I wondered about that test. What was the test really about? Because no professional would have been so irresponsible to tell parents that their child was going to be a doctor based on one set of scores. So I did a Google search, and I put in 1958 first grade, Oakland School District, IQ longitudinal. And the first thing that came up was an article by a woman named Dr. Dolores Durkin. And I thought, Miss Durkin, that was the name of the woman. And it was a landmark study she had done. It involved 49 children. Out of 5,003 first graders that year, 49 of them were identified as having been illegally taught to read. I was one of those readers. <laughs> now, so I found that article. Not only did I find the article, but through detective work, I found the book. You have to imagine my reading this thing, it is like my self-esteem was based on this test. I wasn't supposed to be a doctor. I felt so betrayed. And I read this book, you know, it had all the charts and the layout of facts and figures, um, the oriental kid. 
And I, there were five interviews, and I looked at them. At first, I, I didn't recognize them because the names were masked. But then I saw a comment by a mother who said, I learned you cannot teach children to enjoy music. And I thought, that's my mother. <laughs> so I started reading, and I found out that my parents, they kept debating the question that this woman, Miss Durkin, Dr. Durkin had, which was, how did she learn to read? And instead, my parents said, oh, our, uh, her older brother, Peter, he's so brilliant. You know, he, he didn't learn to read. He waited in the first grade, and, and, and he skipped a grade because he, he just learned so fast. We followed the rules. And, um, and finally, they kind of admitted, well, I might have picked it, picked it up from my brother who was teaching my cousins, our cousins, from China to read. They didn't speak any English. And I had sat in on these little lessons. And the other is that my brother brought home his textbooks, and I would actually copy the words, these letters, and then I would ask him, what is this? And he would tell me. My father then went on to say something else. He said, you know, before the age of, even before the age of four, she always loved to draw pictures and tell stories about them. And she said, she had an amazing imagination. And I had there my confirmation that that test and what that woman had found was indeed the reason that I became a writer. I did one more thing in my search for the answer to my self-esteem and why I became a writer. I found Miss Durkin. I went searching for months and I finally, finally found a number and she was still alive. She didn't remember me. I said, I was the first study, your landmark. She said, I had so many children I've worked with. And I told her what my parents had said. And she said, that was very wrong of them. It had nothing to do with what you would become. And I said, well, I just want to tell you, I became a writer. And she said, of course you did. You loved to read. That's why you became a writer. So I thank you. I thank the library for providing to kids the books they need because they love to read. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction winner, Annie Prue. I'm hoping I don't go into a coughing fit. I live in the Pacific Northwest and we have been inundated with smoke from British Columbia, which seems to be burning up its forests this summer. I'm a little uneasy standing here because I do not think of myself as a real writer. What I am and what I have been for most of my life is a reader. For me, books are everything. I learned to read by osmosis around age four. My mother read picture books to me from infancy, and after a while, I recognized the letters on the page as forming words that could be understood by looking at them as well as speaking or hearing them. In the extended family, I was the one who liked to read, and well-meaning well relatives, blissfully ignorant of literary discrimination, gave me books of all kinds. A first edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin, inscribed as a Christmas gift for Daisy Crowell, one of my great-grandmother's sisters. Another gift before I started school was my Aunt Pug's college psychology text. It had a page of about 10 photographs of facial expressions indicating various emotions as anger and fear. Around the time I entered first grade, my mother took me to the local library in Jewett City, Connecticut. When I understood that here was an endless supply of books, 
and that I could take them home, my life became immensely rich. Catherine Elizabeth Dopp's books about early humans awakened a lifetime interest in prehistory. The Howard V. Brown illustrations inoculated my mind with images of cave bears, saber-toothed tigers, wild-eyed people wearing animal skins, and perched in trees above flooding rivers. The first adult book I read was Jack London's Before Adam. The adult sexuality was strong stuff for an eight-year-old. <laughs> as much as words and stories meant to me, book illustrations were unforgettably important. My vision of European forest was formed by Arthur Rackham's fairy tale illustrations of twisted, choking trees. Until I had occasion to visit the ancient Beavisa forest in Poland this year. I happily mix children's books and adult books. In my early teens, I chose nonfiction books by the color of their bindings. I had read Nordafen Hall's Mutiny on the Bounty with great pleasure, and it was bound in beige buckram. So I subconsciously thought beige buckram books would be the most interesting. <laughs> but Dr. Harold Sorry, Dr. Harold Trott's autobiographical account of his life as a McGill medical student in the 1920s titled Campus Shadows Bound in Midnight Blue disabused me of the notion. In high school, I started accumulating my own library with many modern library editions. The poems of William Blake joined the short stories of Saroy and F. Scott Fitzgerald, Robert Louis Stevenson, Melville, Thoreau, Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway. I was very fond of Marjorie Kinnon Rollins and the watery world of Florida swamp dwellers, lives so exotic compared to mine in rural Connecticut. Years later, I could only think what a thrill it would have been if I had discovered William Bartram's travels at that time. The popular novels, The Egg and I and A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, both captivated my imagination with descriptions of places and people very different from my small New England world. More and more, I was attracted to books about distant places and began to move away from fiction to exploration and sea stories, mountain climbing, wilderness travel, sermons, oratory, and history. My love for history started then, and I later found the French Annales' approach to the past agreeable. I was anxious to get to high school so I could learn Latin. Those were the days when they still taught Latin in high school. <laughs> but I found it difficult and spent many frustrated hours puzzling over Cicero's sentences. I see now it was good training for patient sentence construction as Latin is such a tight, infolded language, it takes yards of English words to tease out the compressed meanings. The first foreign writer I read in translation was Kafka's Metamorphosis, followed by Hashik's The Good Soldier Schwick and Mann's Magic Mountain. I read also Ring Lardner, Ambrose Beers, Norazil Hurst, and John Goldsworthy, Saki Dickens, Conrad Aiken, his stories rather than his poems, and as many Irish short story collections as I could find. I was powerfully attracted to short stories, and Catherine Ann Porter's Noon Wine made an indelible impression. It would take many hours to name the books I've read in my life. But after 50 or so years of this omnivorous reading, I began to sense an invisible something behind all the stories and texts, something I could not quite grasp. After falling into a particularly beautiful passage in anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss's Tristropiques, I started to read less for plot and character and more for discovering finely written passages and shapely paragraphs. I became aware of a structure, aware of the human minds and hands that arrange the words on the page. And I came to believe that fiction, and especially the short story, could be a way for understanding how we fit into constantly changing societies and how the geography of where we live, the region and culture, 
determine the arcs of our lives. So 20 odd years ago or so, I began to work out some of these ideas myself. Now I'm old, but reading more than ever, and I am reading now about genetics, human and animal migrations, estuarine tides, the varieties of seaweed, filmmakers, beautifully designed Polish books, wolves, and wildfire. Ain't it great? <laughs> Thank you all for this wonderful evening and to our sponsors. I hope you have had a wonderful time tonight. And before we go into the Great Hall for dinner, I have, and it says here, breaking news. It's okay. It's okay. All right. We are pleased to announce the date of the 2019 <laughs> National Book Festival. It, it will be on Saturday, August 31st, also the Labor Day weekend. So have a wonderful evening upstairs and let's celebrate books and reading. <laughs> <laughs>